Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Good morning, everyone. My name is Thomas Bowles. I'm the Ag Agent here in Prince William County, and welcome to this week's class on gardening with deer. Leslie Paulson, our Master Gardener extraordinaire, is going to be giving this talk. We've got the chat box working, so if you have questions, please put your questions in there, and we'll get to those as we go through. Please keep your microphones muted so that the sound quality is good for the recording for folks who miss this. It's just 11 o'clock, so Leslie, I'm going to let you take it away. Okay, so this um, is a subject that I have been um, teaching classes on for quite some time. Um, I train several of the new master gardeners in three counties. So we will just talk about deer, that ever-loving, cute thing that we all see in our yard. But then what happens if we have to, to deal with them? And can we read the deer's mind? No, we can't. And the problem really is, is there's no real such thing as a pattern as to what they'll do. It, they change it up all the time. Here's some quick facts for us. Deer are found in 48 different states. There's none in Hawaii. I live there, I'll tell you that. But they become adaptable no matter where they live. And before the Europeans uh, arrived over here, we had 40 million white tail. Can you imagine? But by the turn of the century, it's down to just a half of a million. And the other quick thing about deers is next, the only other animal that is more adaptable than them are rats. Doesn't that make you pause and think? So the estimated of the population has tripled since 1980. There are thousands of acres, as we all know, of habitat that are lost every year. So the deer always live on the edge, and if the edge moves, so do they. And that's what really brings them into our neighborhoods. And the deer never travel more than one to two square miles in a lifetime. So when you see a deer, at the stoplight that's a mile from your house, it's probably one that visits your yard as well. So the pre-hunt population is 850,000 to a million deer in Virginia. They may be very innocent looking, but as we know, they truly are not. And the problems they do on our landscape and, and the mess they create, I mean, look at these trees. What, I guess what really, galls me is so that there they've done this and then the power not the power company but VDOT probably they just leave them there no one will put them out of their misery and here shows you a few more of the problems and the one down there in the lower corner there that is the one that a lot that causes us all money and it's our car insurance because so many deer are hit by cars every year trees they attack a lot and they just they stand on their back legs and eat what they can reach. Um, the damage they do increase in the last decade, and it's because of the populations, it's because of our population shifting and moving and looking for a new place to live, loss of ha habitat, and a decrease of um, hunting. I looked it up before we came on, and last this past year, 2019, there were only 1,283 deer killed in Prince William County. And when I went back just a few years, some years it was high as 1,500. So I don't know what it is. But like I said, one square mile can support 15 to 20 deer. And in Prince William areas, we have 60 to 100 per square mile. The battlefield, just think about the poor battlefield. It has 300 per square mile. It wreaks havoc. Here is um, a website that will give you some information on deer in Prince William, but I'm telling you, it is not up to date, but it does still have some good information. So what can we do? We have to learn to understand their habitat. They select, and then we select plants that are deer resistant, preferably natives. Do not feed or salt the deer. I mean, I work the help desk for the master gardeners as well, and people will call and tell me about their neighbors who are feeding the deer. And if you go to, the next time you feel safe going to Walmart, if you go um, back where they sell sporting goods, you can pick up the rules for hunting and, and trapping. Because in there, it tells you everything, whether you're a hunter or not, that you can or can't do. 
And one of them, there are specific times of the year where you cannot feed the deer. You need fences, um, check fences for fallen sections if you have a lot of land and you can use netting. But you need to understand, like I said, some of their habits and they drink two to four quarts of water a day. I've had them break an expensive bird bath because they didn't just drink out of it. It was on a pedestal and they knocked it over. Um, they're most active during the hours of early morning and evening. That's pretty much the case for all wild animals. And during the day, they shelter in some areas which might be protected. And in the winter time, they can slow their metabolism because if they won't find as much food, but this is the time that you may see a lot of things browsed upon in your yard. They need four to five pounds of food daily and they'll, they'll browse on anything. I mean, even something such as, <clears throat> as hollies, they'll eat when they, if, if we have a bad winter, which we've been lucky, we haven't had that lately. So April to June is when they start establishing fawning territories, which is from five to 20 acres. And that is that so that they can leave their fawns safely. And deer, you, you know, for the most part have one, they can ha have two. But if say, if, if we have a bad winter, their bodies can actually reabsorb a fetus and they won't give birth to it but they need five to seven pounds of food daily and they'll start raiding your gardens during this time. And July to August, the fawns are growing and I will tell you a fawn will eat or taste anything. It doesn't matter how rough, how fuzzy, even how poisonous it is, it could still take a small bite out of it. In August to September, the bucks start rubbing their antlers on trees and shrubs to shed velvet. These branches, our trunks usually aren't very big, one and a half to two inches. We have a, a, a coral bark maple in the deer resistant garden at the teaching garden, and I have to cage it every year, as well as the sumac, because every year they pick on those trees because they're, they're exactly the right size to get their antlers around the trunk or the branch, and then they just rub all the velvet off. Males start marking their territories and they eat from woods and, and some of the crops that other animals are eating like acorns and nuts and persimmons. I have native persimmon trees, they love those. Here shows you the velvet on, on their rack there. And if you live in an area with a lot of deer, if you start going around in the woods and keep your eyes open, you can find those. These have, I have found antlers at the teaching garden. And they sometimes will come back to the same tree every year once they find it, one that works well for their purpose. Here shows you some of the damage they have done on deer where they can strip the bark as well. It's sad for the trees. And then we brings us to rutting season, October to December, or again, they'll start eating mass crops, but they'll frequent gardens. And if a hard frost forces them to switch to woody plants, they will do so. Like I said, again, they will eat anything, just like in the spring, ones do the same. So I'll put some things to keep them from eating our plants. We call it deerscaping, there are deterrents, there are scare devices, physical barriers, and sometimes com community control. At the teaching garden, they hire, um, bow hunters who actually work from a tree stand so that they're only shooting down, not across a field, which is safer. And they will make the, the herd smaller. So here are some of the things you can easily do in your yard. So if you put texture into your plants, like there's fuzzy, leathery, and waxy leaves, think of things like herbs, things that have thorns of some sort, um, things that are leaves that are highly fragrant, like things in the mint, thing. poisonous plants like foxglove and daffodils that they do not eat. A lot of um, the most deer resistant plants are poisonous. But their tastes and preferences can change in a blink, so they keep you on your toes. When you're planting 
landscaping with trees, perennials, and shrubs, you really want to research which they're going to eat. You know, if, like oak leaf hydrangea is a gorgeous native shrub, but the deer love it. So you, you're going to have to figure out a way to stop them from eating it. At the garden, we keep ours caged year round, but it's gotten, it, it has grown in such a manner that you really don't notice it right away. And there are lists that I give you at the end of this where you can go and find lists, excuse me, and I, no matter how resistant a plant says it is, it doesn't mean they'll never eat it. So here are some of the things that they eat the most. But I have to tell you, in my yard, they've never eaten azaleas or my rhododendron. But the arborvitae, I swear, is one of them they like the best. Apple trees. I haven't seen them chew on redbud, but it says they do. It'd be nice if they ate all that English ivy out of your yard, don't you think? Or some of the euonymus, the red burning bush. That is a horrible bush for our landscape and our natural forests anyway. And of course, there's all the plants they like, like hostas and daylilies, which is a good reason not to plant them in the first place. Just think about it. Here again, some more pictures. And how, see how close they'll come up to your property? And they have no fear after when they're after food. Here's some of the things that you can plant in your yard that they should not eat. And like I said, anything in the mint family and the chives, you know, whether they're onion or garlic will work. Yarrow, they do not as a rule eat. And yarrow comes in many different colors now too. And then here's some more things in the mint family. All the monarders, which are a good native plant to plant as well, or bead mom as it's called. Here's a nice picture. And then the things that are have textures. And I want to say these lambs here is this year we have them, I have them in my own yard and they're at the teaching garden. For some reason, they loved our cool spring. They're gorgeous. They're standing nice and tall because sometimes when they don't have the right requirements, it gets too hot, they lay on the ground. And then there's juniper, which is so prickly. And here are some of the bulbs that they will not eat. Again, it's because most of these are poisonous. Bleeding hearts, which is a beautiful old plant, and they don't really bother the native bleeding heart either. And here's some more that you might enjoy having in your yard. But there was one I'd recommend not to put is a butterfly bush. There's better choices out there, people. We are trying to encourage you to plant native plants to support the native wildlife that we need in our yard. Here's some of the annuals that you can plant. Uh, Lantana, I've never had them eat that. The leaves not only are rough, they have a, 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 a scent to them. And marigolds have always been known for planting around vegetable gardens, supposedly to keep insects away. So here we go with some other things. We have um, suitable substitutes, which you can find, or you can, can, excuse me, create uninviting entryways. There is a nursery in the Occoquan area there on 123, there's, there's like a big old house. And she said she's had really good luck, luck with fish line. So I'm not sure what test she'd use. I would use maybe between 10 and 15 pound test line. And about every week she changed it. So she has it strung so that when the deer come out of the woods, they hit it and you want two pieces. You want a piece that hits them in the chest and one that hits them in the knees because if they can't see it and they run in it, it's going to scare them off. But eventually, they'll, they'll learn the path, and that's why you got to mix it up. You can edge with repellent plants, things like rosemary and lavender. You can surround them with things that are unappetizing. Again, plants that are, are leaves are stinky, stinky or, or prickly. And if they cannot have a view, this is more for like vegetable gardens, if your vegetable garden isn't say 12 by 12 and instead you make it four by 12, the deer will not jump in there because they can't see how they're going to be able to get out again. And then there's, you can uh, eliminate unnecessary cover. 
things that won't, you know, stop them. Yeah, let's see what else. You know, most of these, again, you can do a, a xeriscape of plants that don't taste good to them or don't smell good to them. And you, you might put that near the woods where they, where they come out of. That, you know, if you learn some of the deer's habits, you'll be better off because then you can use that. Okay, and then we come with other things that you can do besides what I just said. Um, you can move one garden location, which may not work if you're only on a quarter of an acre, I realize. You, you know, the size of your property and number of deer is what will push you to do some of these things. But it, you can jam their senses of sorts. And I think of things like all the liquid things you can buy to put on them. The, the, the list here on red, I just want to um, tell you to beware. A blood meal and dried blood it is supposed to help repel the deer, but it can also bring in some other four-legged critters like raccoons and possums, um, and you don't want that. And mothballs, I would put them only in places or say there's, it's a foundation and you can hide them in, because you don't want someone else to get used to it or get hold of it and take it away. I've heard fabric softener strips. I, I don't know if it, but these are, some of these are old world things that people used to use. And some are some of the newer, but again, you can rotate what you use so that they don't always smell the same scent that you're trying to repel them with. Here's some of the stuff that smell and taste bad. There's a lot of products on the market. A hot pepper spray, I haven't found that as, I think that, that works well for some of the, the, the squirrels in your yard as well, but with things, it doesn't last long, which is part of the problem. And soapy sprays, you know, we use horticultural soap for some um, problems with plants, and you have to realize that it, if it's gonna be like the weather today in 95 degrees, you do not wanna be spraying any of this stuff on your plants because it could kill your plants as well. So this is a product that comes from the same state as I do, Wisconsin, and it is 100% nitrogen and it's a slow release. It's, it's sort of granular. Um, you can put it in something like knee-high stockings and hang it on a pole at nose height you can put a little bit around your plants, but again, remember, it is nitrogen, so you don't want to be overfeeding your plants. It's not recommended for vegetables, though, because this is made from human sludge. Sounds can repel deers. Um, I got to say that you don't want a radio playing in your yard, though, in the middle of the night, so think, think about that one. Um, high pitch things. I'm not, I haven't seen enough on them to think that it truly works, but I've seen people who use old fashioned pie pans, try them on a, like a clothesline type string or tin cans. You can also get um, sprinkler systems that where they're on a pole and they come out and, and it's motion that makes it come on and that will scare them for a while. Like I said, the filament fish line, an electric fence. I mean, for vegetables, sometimes you have to go that way. And I want to know when we did you to know that when we did at the teaching period of time, we put peanut butter on foil and put it around the wire first, so it would bring the, the deer in. And it worked a bit. Didn't always get the groundhog. So again, um, fencing they can't jump high and wide at the same time. So. If you have the fences around these more narrow beds I talked to you about, you know, I'd say eight feet is the, if you're really having problems. And if, if the problem still is a problem, you can put something in the top so that it comes out. I'll show you a picture in a little bit about that. You want it slanted at the top. Like I said, they need to see a safe landing site or, or they won't jump. Or, and you want to make sure it's secure at the ground so they can't go underneath. Um, if, the reason for the, they're saying in the bottom of the red column there, the invisible fencing for dogs is so that your dogs can chase the deer off, but they won't keep following the deer. But I do know of dogs who don't care if they get zapped as long as they're on the trail of something. So think twice about that one too. Here's some slanted fences that you see on, a, on big property. 
And the other one where they cover it on top, it's a bigger one. So if you can cover it on top, as long as none of your plants grow up into it, you should be fine. But like I said, deer are, we have um, fenced in raised beds at the teaching garden and the deer are great at nibbling everything that comes out of fencing as it grows. So the big thing with them is, like I said, they learn and they're not as stupid as we might think they are sometimes. So here are things that I do not want you to use. Stuff that has any type of human waste products in it that, that you've collected, that's just not a good idea. You know, you hear of such stories where, I think the worst thing that, not the worst thing, but the one, th what I did is my neighbor was having issues. This is like 15 plus years ago with her hostas and she had a young granddaughter. So she was taking her wet, disposable diapers and just putting them under a hosta plant. And it does work for a while, but yet you gotta get rid of that at some time and change it out. And you don't wanna use any poison because when you put poison out for any animal, you do not know which animal is actually going to eat it. So please you know, consider that. And it's the same, I'm gonna digress for a minute. If you're trying to get rid of something like voles or rats in your yard, Use the old fashioned traps. If you put any type of bait, so the mouse or rat or squirrel, whoever eats the bait, then a raptor eats it and they die as well. So think twice. Trapping is not legal. You cannot trap any deer in your yard that, you know, if you have an ex extreme problem, then you want to call somebody and there's, I'll give you numbers at the end of this presentation for that too. And again, if you get the hunting rules, like I said, from Walmart or some other sporting goods stores, you'll see all the things that you can't do when you're trying to stop any sort of nuisance critter in your yard. This is a fawn that my neighbor across the street was walking his two yappy dogs and I'm telling you, they're always barking. They never saw him, he's in the culvert. And the one thing, if you ever find a fawn like this, don't approach it, don't touch it, don't go near it. Because the mother leaves the fawn who has no scent for about six to eight weeks. And then she goes and feeds herself so she can then feed her young. But just leave the fawn alone, the mother will come back for it. And here, like I said, here they are, happy at home, your home, not theirs. But we have to learn to share it with all God's creatures. So here are some of the um, websites and some of them. The Benners Fencing, that is where we got our fencing. If you've been to the teaching garden around the two large vegetable beds, we got the fencing from them. They send you everything you need to put it together. Dear Busters, is the same. Uh, Rutgers has the best list for deer resistant plants. It's many pages long and it starts with the most resistant and goes all the way down to something like hostas. Bobex is the prop product that we use at the teaching garden. I spray in the winter. You just don't have to spray it as often in the winter. But in the summer, I sp we spray about every 10 days. And then the, the deer out is the same in liquid fence. And then again, the other ones are just more information on some other plants. DGIF has a host of information on all kinds of wildlife that you might not like in your yard and you wanna learn about. If you have nuisance wildlife in your yard, whether it's a skunk, a raccoon, um, a, um, a beaver. If you call them, there are people they'll send out to see if your problem is worth pursuing. And if it is, they'll issue a, to, a kill permit. But then you must find someone, they'll probably give you a list, someone who is licensed to trap in your yard. And truthfully, the next time you see someone who traps a squirrel in your yard, and then drives it to some state, county, or federal park and lets it loose, be aware that that is totally illegal. 
Only a trapper who is licensed in the state of Virginia can do that. And there is a fine. It just depends upon the person if they catch you, whether they feel like fining you or not. So think about it. The next one for injured is any animal you find in your yard that is injured. You can go to the site and it'll tell you what to do about it. And then of course, there's our help desk, which we, if we can't find the answer for you, we'll tell you where to find it or we will get back to you after we do find the information. And this conflict line has only been around now for, I think it's time flies when you get older, doesn't it? I think four to five years. They can answer any question you have about the wildlife in your backyard. When, it, when they first put up the um, num, um, created it, I called to ask them about groundhogs because if anyone who's been at our teaching garden, we have, that is really, besides the deer, that is our greatest problem in some of the years is the groundhog who comes and manages to get through all of our fences. And they gave a lot of good advice. It wasn't anything new that I hadn't heard before. I had my fingers crossed that there was some magic thing we could do. Oh, and so that is the last slide. So are there any questions? Okay, let's look here at the chat box. Um... Someone said, I was recently told it's illegal to release an animal, even a paid professional. Any animal has to be destroyed and will not be released. Is that true? You know, that I am not positive what they do with an animal that is trapped. But, you know, there are, I do know for a fact that they have trapped like um, some animals and sometimes they're taking to that Smithsonian place in Front Royal? I think it depends uh, quite a bit on what it is. What, well, it depends on what it is and it depends on um, what the permit allows. But generally speaking, um, animals that are trapped are, uh, are sacrificed. It's a, but, yeah. it's a huge problem because with deer, for example, if you take deer and you put them someplace else, you're contributing to the problem someplace else. If you take anything in the rodent family and move it someplace, then it's a territorial issue and that rodent will either have to kill or be killed um, in this new territory that he's been plopped down in. Exactly, and that's what, the other thing too, especially for deer, and I didn't mention it, is we haven't got it in Prince William County. It's mostly in the southwest part of Virginia right now, and that's wasting disease in deer. So I think that a lot, like Thomas says, a lot of the animals, they have, it's like if you, you trap animals for a purpose. And excuse me, because I'm going to use something that some people don't believe in trapping. Say they're feral cats. You remove feral cats from an area and then more will just move in to replace them. So it, there's a fine line, but if you really want the answer on any specific animal, if you call the conflict control number there, I'm sure that they can tell you about a variety of animals, what happens to them. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, the only other, Thing we have is 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 it possible to get copies of the last few slides? Um, they will be with the video um, that'll be on our YouTube channel, and I'm not 100% sure, but I believe the uh, the PDF of the slides are usually sent out. Um, but if not, you can uh, if you get in touch with the help desk and say. Yeah. You want the last three slides? I can put them we on can a document send those to that you. we can send you to, to you. And I'm if you do it sometime this week, I'll I'll, I'll I'll create it when I get done and let the ladies, I'm one of the ladies, but there's um, four of us that do the help desk and we can just send it to you. So um, we have a, a comment. Um, somebody has a, small back or a 
2.6 acre backyard and their HOA only allows four foot fencing, but they've tried a uh, fishing line at five and six feet and that seems to work. And if you have issues with fence heights with your HOA, that is the one nice thing about the uh, monofilament fishing line that a lot of times they can't see it. Your HOA compliance people can't see it and aren't gonna give you a whole lot of problem about it. Um, typically you're, you want it you want it so that it's either just barely visible to the, the deer or just barely invisible. Um, I want to think that usually it's somewhere between eight and 12 is usually the recommendation for uh, what kind of fishing line to use. Yeah. Cause you don't want it to cause extreme harm. If you get something that's high, you know, like 25 pounds, that's, it's going to be harder they could get trapped in it and then you're going to have to deal with that. You don't want that. Well, and it's, it's a bit overkill too, because, because yeah. it's, it's really, it's about the deer running into something and not really realizing that's there and getting spooked and running away. It's not so much um, that it, the line itself is going to, to stop them from breaking through. But if you all come to the teaching garden, you can see the bed where um, we have deterrent pl plants and resistant plants. And for the most part, they, they do leave them alone. The one thing I have in that plant that they munch on once in a while is our native sumac. But I think it, it's more so it's the young deer at the beginning of the season. So that's the other thing, sometimes um, if you have new plantings, say shrubs and trees, you might want to just spray them until the leaves aren't new and tender because that's when the, animal, the deer will eat them the most. Once they become, like th uh, uh, think of oak leaf when it reaches maturity and not as many animals will, will munch on it as when it's a brand new thinner green and sweeter leaf, I would say, at least to them. So a question about uh, squirrels in the vegetable garden. Um, <laughs> how do you protect it? You don't. Um, squirrels are really, really difficult to deal with unless you completely enclose <laughs> and cage vegetables. It's really hard to keep them out. Um, we have some raised beds that are designed to keep deer and groundhogs out and we've had issues where the squirrels will just climb that cage get in the inside devastate the crop and then leave um squirrels are extremely difficult to deal with um i don't know any way other than to have dog on patrol or to completely encase them with netting of some kind. Yeah, I mean, especially if you have a large yard, I mean, you might be able to put a top. If I'm thinking vegetables now and not plants, of course, that you might be able to put that, like that one picture I had, let me see, where the netting was on the top. But the problem is sometimes, shoot, did I pass it? that the, um, they could get, you know, the, they could get tangled in it. No, that's no. I'm sorry. I don't know where it is in here. Oh, wait. There it is. You could do something like that. But, but you, you know, if you're growing, you had to watch what you're growing because you don't want it to get tangled. And then that makes, means every time you want to deal with your vegetables, you're going to have to take it off. So, but that might help in the short term. Someone mentioned that they have chickmunks in their yard and they put dog <laughs> hair in the tulip leaves. Uh -huh. um, there's a, I haven't seen any scientific study on it, so, uh, but there's a lot of anecdotal um, information about hair being put around gardens to help right. repel. That was on the, that was on the list. Yeah, you know, and for tulips, if you have tulips, if you're getting them to bloom every year in this county of Virginia, kudos to you. Because for the most part now, 
I know we recommend that they're not worth planting because that isn't cold enough, they don't come back healthy anyways. But I know if it, you grew up with tulips, you like them. Sometimes the best thing you can do is grow them in a pot. You have more control over them, a little more control over them. I won't say, thinking of what the squirrels have been doing to the pots on my deck recently. Good luck. That's always say if gardening keeps you on your toes because you always gotta be thinking of new solutions to problems and some of them are old problems that have been around forever so yeah unfortunately um squirrels are so nimble it's excluding them is very very difficult that looks like that's our last question well thank you all for coming and we hope you'll join us next week when we're going to talk about hydroponics growing plants in water the video for this should be up within the next two days on our youtube channel and again, if you have specific questions, please contact our Horticultural Help Desk. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you all for coming. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know. Give us your questions, your comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. For more information on lawns and gardens, please contact the Extension Hort Help Desk at mastergardener at pwcgov.org. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.